Shalom, everyone. Welcome again to another edition of Seekers of Meaning, the podcast arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address. Uh, we welcome you to these podcasts um, designed to explore some of the issues that surround our own longevity and this spiritual journey that we are all on. And if you have a comment or a question, we welcome your comments and questions to me, Rabbi Address, at JewishSacredAging.com. Um, and if you are interested in perhaps sponsoring a series of these podcasts, just email me at that same address and we'll take it from there. Uh, we are very, very pleased and honored to welcome to uh, today's edition of Seekers of Meaning, uh, Meryl Fell, the author of a new CCAR published book uh, called uh, Longing, uh, Poems of a Life. So first of all, um, Meryl, welcome. Welcome to Seekers of Meaning, and I hope you're well. And you're up in Massachusetts, correct? I, if I remember yes. correctly. Yes. And and thank you for having me. I, well, I I very much appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad you're joining us. with lots to talk about. Um, first of all, the book, fascinating book of poetry. CCAR Press is the publisher, and so obviously you can get it through uh, the CCR press, but also through the great God Amazon. Um, and I imagine in, in, in smaller bookstores, bookstores will carry it as well. Longing poems of a life. Um, why, why this book? What, what was, what, what was the motivation to, I know you're published a lot and, but this is a very, it seems to be very personal. Uh, as I read through the book, very, very personal book of poetry. Um, what was that aha moment that got you into this? What, what, what started this day? It, it might be helpful to, to talk first about, um, how do I write a poem? Uh, poems come to me in two different ways. One, sometimes in the middle of the night, um, <laughs> and I, I kind of like go away. I'm not. Let me sleep. But I know if I don't write it down, it's gone by the morning. Uh, and sometimes during daylight hours, a poem will suddenly emerge. And uh, I remember once driving and pulling off to the side of the road. <laughs> <laughs> and a friend was coming along and said, are you okay? And I was like, go away, I'm writing a poem. <laughs> uh, so that's one way. The second way is sometimes I'm aware I haven't written in a while. Uh, and I dedicate some time when I won't be disturbed. And I sit with a pad and a pen. And I just quiet myself and begin to go deep and listen and listen and go deeper. And there are words there that want to be spoken. So this book began with the first poem in the book, uh, which was a gift, really. It was probably my first, earliest, my earliest memory. Uh, and I'm sitting in a corner of my family apartment, and maybe I'm three, and I'm just observing in the poem. What's happening? What am I seeing? What am I doing? What am I feeling? Uh, and out of that poem, that initial poem, many poems flowed after. So, the as I said before, this is a very it, it, it intensely personal um dare I say, semi-autobiographical collection of poetry. You dare say it's um, autobiographical. <laughs> I'd like to ask. Yeah. There's one, there's a couple of poems um, 
I, I'd like you to to read one of them to begin to begin this conversation that I think it's 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 um it touches the idea of time but but beautifully and in a lot of the work that we do in Jewish sacred aging this concept of time keeps coming up over and over and over again in a variety of different ways even before the pandemic but the pandemic has really like capitalized it with big neon signs around it so on page 73 of the book is this poem called Solstice. And it's, it's really by it's one paragraph. Could, could you just look at it for us, read it for us uh, since you wrote it? And, um, then when we're done, just talk to me about what's really behind this, especially that closing line, which I relate to and I'm sure many people relate to as well. Okay. Sure. Solstice, lying in bed, our limbs intertwined, anchored and warm under old down. The night sky still dark, and suddenly my blood stops. I can feel the platelets piling up in the pores, the waves crest higher and higher, unnatural. Can blood flow backwards? And I recognize my body has turned to fear, fear in the blood, in the platelets, waking me with no memory of dreaming. The enemy is time. So talk to me about the is your enemy time because all go ahead i'll i'll shut up <laughs> um certainly i think for most of us when we're young when we're in the middle years uh Unless some crisis or urgency or tragedy interferes, we pretty much go day to day with the inner sense of, I'm immortal. You know, like death disappearing from this life. It, I, I know it happens, you know, sometimes it happens to people I love, but you don't really, you don't really connect, certainly not moment to moment. You couldn't live. You don't connect to, I am finite. Someday I won't be here. Um... I think that that poem and the the perspective of the book in general uh, is the view from the later years and the awareness of I won't always be here. My limbs will not always be intertwined with someone who is my beloved. Um, I may at some point be alone in this bed, or I may leave behind the person with whom I'm intertwined. So in that sense, the enemy is time. There are poems in this book that elicit a laugh, a smile of recognition. Uh, I'm a I'm a deep lover of life, and um, I relish humor wherever I can find it. But a lot of these poems are very serious, especially, well. Yeah, a lot of these poems are very serious. 
No. Well, there's 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 images in the poems. There's um that really are fascinating to me. Um in this section Ain Getty, and I and I do want you to I one of the things I wanted to ask you is what what does that is it Ain Getty or is it is it a person or is it a place? And but you ha- but you write but you write some of the lines that really um they're sermon lines. <laughs> Um, so for example you you have a poem called when you come to it when you come to it you will not care and it really picks up on what you were just saying it says 40 years ago today i lived in a young woman's body 40 years ago today i lived in a young woman's body for those of us who are getting older um you know the chronological age doesn't necessarily match our spiritual age so that line just evoked in me so many conversations that we have as part of my work of saying yeah i can't get down the steps as well i can't run as i can't walk as i can't hear as well i can't see as well but my my brain is i'm still 28 years old so could you just unpack that line? That it's a beautiful line, but it really speaks to longevity and aging. So um, I can't resist an anecdote first. Maybe thirty years ago, no, uh, go ahead. I I, um, uh, I, w- I was speaking for a, a, a national women's organization. And it was a very large audience with an age range of literally like 20s to 80s, maybe 90s. And the person introducing me began addressing the audience with the following. She said, next month, I want to tell you, we're having a program which will be of particular interest to those of you who are aging. And then she introduced me and I got up to speak and I said, I cannot resist. Could those of you who are not aging come speak to me after the program? I, I'm really curious to meet you. In other words, right. we are all aging. Yes. I mean, right. Um, uh, what was that poem about? You know, 40 years ago, I lived in a young woman's body. Uh, it was re-entering, I can't say the moment, I'd have to say the day when I gave birth to my first child. Um, and I lived in a young woman's body. Uh, and I guess that kind of time travel is something that's, that's really a part of me and maybe particularly a part of me as a poet that in the moment I'm living in the moment, but to really understand what that moment was, to sit with it in, um, in some peaceful quiet and, and re-enter it so that you can more easily look around and see that's what was happening. That's what was happening. Uh, I, I do that very often with, um, major experiences in my life and with the most ordinary, mundane experiences in my life. That's where poetry lies. And I think that's where Spiritual health lies. Um, 
Again, we're speaking with Merrill Fell, the author of Longing Poems, Poems of a Life Available through Bookstores, Amazon, published by the CCAR Press. Um, Merrill, I got to ask you before we move on to some of the other poems, um, the place of poetry right now, is there a, is poetry more spiritual than prose? And is there a resurgence in interest in poetry? Do you find it easier to express yourself in poetry rather than prose? It's a different part of me. I tell the people who write with me, write with a pen, write with a pad, don't write on the computer. The gift of the computer is that it goes quicker, quicker. and Spiritual journaling, spiritual writing, poetry is all about slower, slower. So um, when I write prose, I use my laptop and I write quicker, quicker. And it's, it's much more centrally coming from the intellect. No, I, and poetry comes from the heart. Uh, that said, um, I have to admit, uh, you know, I, I have, well, you may not know, I, I have poetry in many, actually, uh, contemporary prayer books from different movements. Um, and I find myself in general more connected to the spiritual leaders of our times. Thank you. Who is Lillian? Oh. Because you have a section in your book called Lillian. Lillian was my mother. She was a beautiful woman. In the sense, I mean, you know, she was a, a lovely looking person, but, but she had a beautiful soul. Um, and the section about Lillian uh, is ostensibly about the four days she was dying in the hospital in Clearwater, uh, where my parents were then living. Um, and I was 28, 29. Um, and it was my misfortune that that was my first death. Uh, because you learn a lot when you accompany the dying. And that was my first experience. And if I'd already had that experience with someone else, I would have had a little practice for when it happened to the person I was most connected to in my life. Um, literally by an umbilical cord, but by much more than that. So that section, the poems in that section, kind of move back and forth from the reality of that hospital room to moments in her life that were pivotal and moments in my childhood that were pivotal um, that involved her. There's some imagery in that section. I was struck also, there, there's a poem, the, the first poem about in, in the Lillian section about, obviously in the hospital room with the straw. This followed by a section on that really is, to me, on memory. So you have this lovely poem when they're gone, do people know that they're remembered? Um, 
and you channel one of the one of the um the Jew the Jewish literary heroes Bancha. So uh talk to me about why Bancha shows up in this poem. Oh okay. and who he was. Okay. So um that's a section there are seven sections in the book. That section is um uh kind of little stories within poems of people especially beloved to me um and and moments that i shared with them so uh when people are gone do they know that they're remembered is a poem about my relationship to rabbi max and esther tickton who were uh really luminaries and pioneers in Hillel work, uh, uh, you know, working with students on, on college campuses. Um, Max was a Hillel director at the University of Chicago. Esther was a psychotherapist. Um, and this is about a visit that, um, my husband Eddie and I made to them in the f very first years of our marriage, we were living in Champaign-Urbana uh, at the University of Illinois, where Eddie was Hillel director. And we had driven up to see, to Chicago, to see Max and Esther. And I didn't know them yet, and I was very shy and still kind of intimidated by this older man who was a distinguished rabbi. Um, and we sat down to breakfast and they wanted to know what I wanted to eat. And I, I was literally, I, I was too, um, I was too timid to make a request. And finally they, they kind of got the gist of it. And I got cornered into saying, I'd like a roll with butter. And then everyone was hysterical because Eddie and Max and Esther knew the parrot's story about Buncha Schweig, who um, was a character in Yiddish literature, uh, who who was timid, um, you know. All his life, he just held back any needs he had. And, and he had kind of a terrible life. Um, and, and in some circles, he was considered like the epitome of the holy Jew who doesn't ask for anything whose needs are very small and constricted. Um, so he dies and he appears before the heavenly court. And they're all like, Buncha is here. He's like this, you know, holy icon for his modesty. And they want to know, what do you want? Everything is yours. And all he can come up with is, I'd like a roll in butter. So the flip side of Buncha is he doesn't grab hold of life. He doesn't make demands. He, how can you live a full life when you don't grab hold and you always settle for a roll and butter? Um, And I wonder in the poem about the me at 21, did Max and Esther realize that I was Buncha? And, and actually how I grew to be a person who grabs hold of life and makes demands and has dreams and visions and they were an early part of encouraging that and calling that out from me.
May they rest in peace. It's a great story. It's a great poem. Um, bef- as we re- as we were running out of time, I want to close with one final poem uh, that actually picks up on this idea of life and, in a sense, grabbing hold of it and and the time that we opened with. So, on page uh, seventy nine of the book, and again, we're talking with Merrill Feld, the author of Longing Poems of a Life. There's this lovely, lovely poem called Respite After Darkness. Respite After Darkness, that in truth, you could use as a benediction at a service. Um, you know, really, because it, so I'd like you to close, if possible, just, just read us this poem as a way of saying, think about, think about, especially this last paragraph. Go ahead, Merle. Thank you. It's wonderful that you chose these two poems because in a sense, their book ends with one another um, and in conversation with one another. Respite after darkness. The rising joy in the morning when I wake with little pain. My spirit peacefully coming to consciousness. I wake with the rising light, warm under comforter and rising hissing steam. Beside me, I hear beloved soft breathing. I have come through the darkness intact. I rise now on new calves' legs, wobble to the bathroom. Blessed is the one who returns me to my life, who rises me back to my life. For me, this time of life is a time of gratitude, more gratitude than I ever experienced daily, moment to moment, truly gratitude. Merrill Feld, um, we are grateful for your poetry. We're grateful for your time and grateful for you. So thank you very much again. Uh, the book Longing, uh, Poems of a Life, Bookstores, Amazon, published by the CCAR Press. Merrill, just, uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, just thank you for and uh, all that you've done and continue to do. And um, just Be well. Hope to bump into you in person sometime soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. What a pleasure. Thank you. To all of you, thank you again for joining us on today's edition of Seekers of Meaning, the TV show and podcast arm of Jewish Sacred Aging. If you'd like to uh, contact us, just feel free to email me at rabbi address at jewishsacredaging.com. And we appreciate your continued support. If you'd like to uh, make a tax-free donation to help support our work in these podcasts, Please go to the website, jewishsacredaging.com, and just find the conveniently located donate button. Click on that. Follow the prompts. It's really, really, really easy, and we do appreciate it. Secrets of Meaning is recorded and produced at the Lubetkin Media Studios here in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And a big shout out to our producer, the genius, the guru of electronics, Steve Lubetkin. I'm your host, Rabbi Richard Address, and I look forward to greeting you on our next Seekers of Meaning podcast and TV show from Jewish Sacred Aging. In the meantime, everyone, please stay safe, please stay healthy, please be kind. Bidarabah, Shalom.